All right, good morning, everyone. How are you feeling? Are you excited? Are you having fun in New York City? Yeah? Oh, that was a little, that was a little hesitant. Hopefully by the end of the day, you will have had a brilliant time. That's our goal. My name's Amanda Hosking. I'm the Director of Admissions for the College of Performing Arts. You've probably received at least one email from me. Yeah? Perhaps more. Uh, I'm so thrilled to welcome you here today. I want to kick things off with our university president, uh, David Van Sant, to welcome you. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. And I apologize. I have a bit of a cold. At least my voice is back uh, today. A little bit. A little bit. But I want to take this opportunity to um, welcome all of you here to, um, uh, to the new school. Through the course of this day, you're going to hear from your deans, faculty, and staff about the various aspects of the programs. Um, and you can ask them any question, any question you like. What I'm here to do, though, is to congratulate you. And congratulations both to the admitted students and to their parents. Um, the fact that you're sitting here means that you're, you're something special. We look for a particular kind of student at the New School. We look for a student who has very strong creative uh, capability, um, but also wants to use that creativity um, to, make the world, to make the world a better place in one way, in one way or the other. So you're, we, you know, we, we specifically look for that kind of student, and uh, you should be very proud because you fit, within that, uh, you fit within that type. Now, the new school is really the place to come for that. We are the only university in the world that has a large comprehensive design school surrounded by very strong social science, humanities, and performing arts, as well as some, as well as some management. Um, and we're very unique, uh, very unique in that respect. And that's uh, only more important in today's, in today's world. Um, that kind of education is going to provide you with the ability uh, to, to, to work cross disciplines. And you have to do that today. Uh, nobody is going to just uh, simply survive or have a successful career just by doing one thing. You have to be very flexible, resilient, uh, and, and um, uh, do all sorts of things. Be, be very creative in what you're doing. Finally, I think you know what's most inspiring about the new school. Certainly, our physical plant is 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 pretty nice. I think um, I hope you uh, enjoy it. Right in the middle of the great city in the world, New York City. But probably more important are your faculty, um, who are going to be teaching you. They're an incredible important part of this. And then finally, um, what's really important are the people around you, your fellow students. So I urge you during the course of the day um, to talk to each other, get to know your fellow students because. Uh, if you decide to come here, which I very much hope you will, uh, you will be uh, in class and in school in, in working with them, playing with them um, through the course of your time here, through the course of your time here at the new school. So again, I want to welcome everyone, and I very much look, uh, look forward to meeting all of you uh, in the fall. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Has everybody found a seat? Yeah, please. I hardly spit at all when I talk. So the front row is safe-ish. All right, yeah. I'm just, I just enunciate like a proper drama slash musician should. Yes? Excellent. I'm so thrilled to welcome you. Congratulations to every single one of you. Being admitted to the College of Performing Arts is a true honor, and we are really honored to have you here today. I want to play a short video for you, and then I want us to get right down to um, Right down to the business of answering your questions, talking about our school, and sharing with you why we think that the College of Performing Arts is the best place to be. Sound like a plan? Excellent. Two, three, four. <laughs> At the New School, we think a lot about this particular question, the question of what does it mean to be an artist in the 21st century? Performing artists in the 21st century are going to have to have deep technique training. They're going to have to be fearless as artists and as individuals, but that's really just the beginning. We also need artists who are going to be flexible, nimble, and to be able to apply that technique uh, and that artistry across a range of opportunities. Artists need to be entrepreneurs. They need to grow their own franchise. They need to have craft and their own voice. They need to see themselves as citizen artists who can make a positive difference in the world. And they have to be ready, most importantly, to surrender 
to all the opportunities that are going to be put in front of them. A new community of artists working in brand new spaces that are intentionally designed for collaborative work. So students from drama, actors, writers, and directors are working with musicians at Manus, composers at Jazz. They're working with students from Parsons Design and Technology. These young artists are going to be defining the future of their art form. A great example where students from the School of Drama, from Manus, and from the School of Jazz are working together every semester is a course called the Improvisation Artists Lab that's taught by Jane Ira Bloom and Joe Grafazzi. And over the course of those 15 weeks, the drama students are singing, the jazz students are acting, they're all interacting in different ways to create very moving work. Our production of Happy End was an opportunity for students to learn from each other where musicians and vocalists are learning from actors, actors are learning from singers, musicians are on stage performing, and this is really indicative of what we see as the future for the College of Performing Arts. What happens when you bring Parsons to the table, one of the great design schools of the world, working on costumes, lighting, on props to create innovation in set design? You can actually have the faculties from these schools working together, you can have the students from these schools working together, learning from one another, and bringing the best of design to create the most glorious production that would be possible. We consider this to be a new school advantage. Today, in the 21st century, I think part of what it takes to be successful is to have your heart, eyes, and ears open. You have to make your way through a complex world. You have to take charge of your own career. You're not going to survive in a practice room. You survive in the real world, and that's what we're committed to at the new school. I hope you're feeling excited about what the new school has to offer and what our College of Performing Arts has to offer for you. You're all students specifically admitted to that college, um, and that's where we're going to focus today. But I do want to touch briefly on the other schools because we are part of a larger university and it is a huge part of the advantage of what the new school has to offer. So being part of a university that houses Parsons, that houses Lang College of Liberal Arts, it allows our students to not only explore the depth of their passion for their performing arts, but also the breadth of their passions across disciplines. And that's something that you're gonna hear a lot about today. Um, we want you to be interdisciplinary. We don't think that you should have just one passion. We want you to pursue all of the things that you're passionate about. Does that make sense? Excellent. So the new school has about 10,000 students from 116 countries, all 50 states, across 134 degree and diploma programs and five colleges. We're very, very proud to call ourselves the new school and we're very, very proud of our College of Performing Arts. So I would love to take a moment and just talk about who's in, our, in the room today. By a show of hands, can I see my Manus students? Ooh. Can I see my jazz students? Very nice. And my drama students? Very, that's great. We've got a nice, a nice coalition across, across the schools, which is amazing. Um, does anybody think they came the furthest today? Did anyone cross a state line to get here? Who crossed a state line? OK. <laughs> Did anyone cross a time zone to get here? All right. <laughs> Did anyone come from another country? Ooh. <laughs> Where did you come from? India. India. That's pretty far. What about you? France. France. It's so exciting. It's so exciting to be part of a community where people really do come from all over the place. The new school was founded nearly a century ago. It's not that new. Did you know that? <laughs> Does anyone know why it's called the new school? Any guesses? Yeah. on new ideas. Oh my gosh, I didn't hire her. 
That is precisely right. That is so wonderful. The new school is about new ideas. It was founded by academics who wanted to think outside the box, who wanted to try something new. And that is what we continue to strive toward today. Um, I would like to introduce our deans. I'd love to have you come up. Richard, do you want to start, or do you all sure. want to come up? Uh, I'd like to start by introducing uh, Richard Kessler, who's the executive dean of the College of Performing Arts and the dean of Manus School that's, of Music. That's correct. All right. Mm, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Amanda. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to see your faces today. I'm glad to see all of you today. It means a lot to us. It's hard for me not to think, you know, I have a 13-year-old daughter, so it's very difficult not to think about this moment for all of you as to the moment I'll be looking at five years from now. Um, and I want to say a couple things. I want to congratulate every one of the students who's gotten here today and everything that you've done across um, your lives and the commitment that you have to your art forms, the hard work. I think everyone in this room understands this, but not everyone understands the work that it takes to be an artist, the commitment, the hard work, the discipline, the hours. Everyone's here because they were touched by the arts. They love the arts. Um, it, it's made the hair stand up on the back of your neck, and you decided that you wanted to do this, you wanted to study this, that you had to study it, and you're here today for that passion, that commitment, that love. And for every parent, I want to also congratulate you for everything that you've done in supporting your children and how much moments like this must mean to you, the pride that you have. Um, it's not the end of the journey by any stretch of the imagination, but it's certainly um, the sort of drawing to a close of a period and moving forward with a very important new period. Um, and for the undergrads in a period where you're moving out of the house, it's a big thing. So I just wanted to recognize that. I also wanted to tell you a few things about the new school, about the College of Performing Arts that the materials may not tell you. Um, we, um, there's a few things that are important to us. There are many things that are important to us, but there's a few things that I want to share with you right now, and I'm completely improvising. So uh, for those who aren't looking at my notes, which were all of you, my, what I'm saying right now has no resemblance to any of our notes. Um, I will get to the presentation in a second, but I wanted to say that um, we, this is a community of love. We believe that the arts are love. This is a supportive and rigorous community. This is a community that will support you to develop your craft. This is a community that will support you to have the best education that you possibly can. And the sort of second thing that's important to us is that we want to, and we do everything we possibly can every day in looking at the program and in, in adapting the program and evolving the program and shepherding the program or programs to ensure that you will be prepared for the world that you will enter. Not the world of 2000, not the world of 1950, not the world of 1850, but you will be prepared for the world that you enter. Um, and that we believe that not only can you have the artistic skills that you need, that you've always needed, but that we can help provide you with the broad-based education that will prepare you for all the things you have to do. Because today, artists have to do much more than they ever did before. You can have that, that, the skills. You can be that kind of artist. And you also can do all the other things that the world asks of you. I know this to be true because I see people doing it all the time. And this, in my heart and all of our hearts as leaders of this institution, this is essentially where we are. Now, back, now I should get to the, uh, we do take a citizen as artist approach. <laughs> and um, our, our <laughs> that's, um, you're going to move these things along? I as, will. So, so I want to, I want to, <laughs> did I use up my time already? No, you're great. All right, I'll tell you <laughs> a few other things that you don't know, perhaps don't know about the new school. The interesting thing is the new school has an incredible history in performing arts, one of the great histories in performing arts. It's sometimes overlooked, but really ex experiment. The greatest artists of the early 20th century through the 20th century and to this very day have taught and worked at the new school. To go back to the great Martha Graham, the great choreographer and dancer, to go to John Cage, to go to Henry Cowell, to take a look at um, the dramatic workshop in Erwin Piscator, for those of you that know the movie On the Waterfront, 
And for, uh, for those of you who don't, you should go see it immediately. But the, on the waterfront, one of the iconic American films of the 20th century has this famous scene. And the scene has Rod Steiger, and it has Marlon Brando in the back of a car. And it's known for this phrase, you, I could have been a contender. Well, both Marlon Brando and Rod Steiger are alums of the new school. Um, Harry Belafonte, uh, Tony Curtis, I can go down the list, B. Arthur. This is a school where the great Hungarian conductor George Zell taught. This is the school where Simeon Bishkov, Joanne Folletta, Richard Good, Murray Pariah. This is the school of Robert Glasper. This is the school of Brad Meldow. Across all three of these areas, this is the school of Bradley Cooper. It's the greatest artists of the early 20th century. It's the greatest artists walking around today. Um, so it, it is something that we look to continue to instill. We look at, as I said, not only the support and the rigor, but we're very interested in this issue of how can we break the rules? Now, I went to Manus. I also went to, the, uh, to Juilliard, and I taught at the Manhattan School of Music. I know a lot of the conservatories. Conservatory um, performing arts training is often very much about rules and tradition. And we're not throwing traditions out the, out the door. But when we look at the history of experiment, what we basically believe is that we are trying things. We are looking at the question of how can you put on a experimental opera that's not just coming out of uh, students from the Manus Opera Program, but that has students from the jazz school in it, jazz and contemporary music school, and has school students from the drama school in it. And we did Philip Glass's The Fall of the House of Usher last February. That's exactly how that production was created. When we did Robert Ashley's Dust the year before, which was recognized by the New York Times as one of the top performances of 2017, the only collegiate performance recognized by the New York Times in any style or genre as a best of 2017. That was populated by students from the Jazz and Contemporary Music School, by the Manus School of Music, and the School of Drama. And we have created classes that bring these opportunities together for students to break down those walls. We're creating productions by the day. Um, and we are bringing on faculty who work around these areas. Does it mean that every student has to be in a blended or hybrid class all the time? No. But it means that there are opportunities here that I do not believe there are very many other schools provide. There are opportunities in technology. There are opportunities in cross-disciplinary work. This is the kind of school, if you want to be a drama major, if you want to be a, a BFA student in the School of Drama and you want to be an economics minor, you want to be a graphic design minor, you can do that and you can be studying that minor at the top art and design school in the United States. There are things here at the new school that no other school in the country provides. And these are things, of course, we're very proud of. Now I want to go on a little bit to speak. Um, yeah. Speak about Manus. Now, I've spoken to you a little bit about the new school. Let me talk about one thing that I think is also not as well understood as it should be, our faculty. Um, we have a truly extraordinary faculty across the board at all three schools. This is a school where there are Academy Award winners, where there are MacArthur Genius Award winners, where there are Grammy, Pulitzer Prize. This is the school with the very top mid-career opera composers. Um, this is the school that has um, the bass player, Reggie Workman, who played with John Coltrane. This is the school where Jane Ira Bloom teaches soprano saxophone, the, who was voted the top rated soprano saxophonist um, by Downbeat. This is a school that has faculty across virtually every area, whether it be arts journalism, whether it be theory, whether it be history, whether it be technology. I think that this has often been one of the things that has not been as well understood. And to be honest, sometimes it's been frustrating for me. Um, so I'm really glad to be able to talk to you just a little bit about the faculty. I would encourage you to look over the faculty. And perhaps maybe look a little deeper if you, when you go back and you take a look at things. You might be a horn student that takes a look at the horn faculty. But it's not just the horn faculty. Who's teaching ear training? Who's the conductor? Who's conducting the contemporary ensembles? Um, who's teaching aesthetic inquiry? Who's te teaching entrepreneurship? Who's teaching the art of engagement? I'll give you just one last example. So someone teaching entrepreneurship. 
um, is one of the top curators in the world, Lee Moore Tomer. She's the head of um, performances for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Before, prior to that, she was at WNYC Radio. Prior to that, she was at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. These are the types of people we have in virtually every course that we run. You can also see, and as I mentioned earlier, technology is critically important to us. If you're a BFA student in drama, you will not leave that program without a deep understanding of technology. You will get behind the camera. You will get in front of the camera. The actors will direct. The directors will act. The playwrights will be involved with all of this. You will be editing films. You will know how it all works. And the same thing I can say for all the schools. If you're an undergraduate student at Manus, you are going to be taking things like um, you're going to be studying Ableton Live. You are going to know how technology works. And if you decide that you want to go past the basics, there's so much that you could then take. Courses like Super Collider, which is, music, um, which is basically music programming, music coding. We have so much that you can enter into, but we, we want to make sure that every student um, has a rich experience with technology, because otherwise we wouldn't be running a program from 2018. We would be running a program that would be more like 1918. <laughs> and we don't want to be doing that. We also have, as I talked about, tremendous collaboration across all of the different programs. But an interesting thing that we have is um, we're in New York City. So let's face it, it would be different if we were um, in the middle of the country and we didn't have access to essentially the cultural and performing arts capital of the world. So we do everything we can to capitalize upon opportunities, to make opportunities possible for our students, whether it's partnerships in the drama school with Tectonic Theater, or just last week, the Manus Orchestra was performing with the Martha Graham Dance Company at City Center for the Martha Graham season. Or we recently brought in the third rated, the third rated jazz club in the United States, the Stone. We have moved it into the new school. It's in the lobby of Arnhold Hall five nights a week. The greatest jazz performers from all over the world are performing in that club 49 weeks each year, five nights a week. Opportunities for our students to hear these students, to, to hear these artists, opportunities for our students to attend workshops with these artists. We had our students at Manus working with Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. I can just go down the list because it's kind of extraordinary, but we do everything we can to ensure that we are taking advantage of being in a city like this. Um, again, if we were in the middle of Indiana, we might not have these opportunities, but we are in New York City. Now, let me speak just a little bit about the Manus School of Music, and then I'm going to hand it off to my colleagues. So Manus is 101 years old. Um, it, it's an iconic conservatory. It is a conservatory where much of what we know as modern music theory was created and founded at Manus. It um, has a long history. It was created in 1916 by David and Clara Manus, who were musical royalty at that period of time. It is, as I said, the school that create, that brought Richard Good and Murray Pariah and Frederica von Stott, and I could just continue to go down the list of people that have attended Manus. It, um, is a, it is a relatively small, relatively intimate school. It's about 475 students at this point in time. It's a, students, it's a school where people tend to know each other's name. And it's a school, I graduated from a school, and of course things change. I'm not saying the school's this way, but it used to be, we used to say everybody wanted a pat on the back, but no one would give it. Manus is not that kind of place. Manus is the place where people cheer each other on. Manus is the, that place where you see the groups of students who smile at each other, who support each other. And certainly, Manus has always had the history of having a faculty like that. So when I say that the arts are love, which is something we fundamentally believe, we, we want to manifest that in everything that we do, in the ways we support our students. And Manus has certainly, for 100 years, always been that kind of place. Now, the one last thing I'd say about Manus is, I think about 15 years ago, Manus was known perhaps as being one of the most conservative American conservatories. And it's very interesting because it's really been flipped on its head. Is um, We've really taken advantage, particularly as Manus has moved down. Four years ago, Manus was on 85th Street, isolated a bit from the new school. Now down in Arnhold Hall, together with the drama school, together with the jazz and contemporary music school, Manus has probably become, I think, the most progressive um, music conservatory in the United States. Um, it's a particularly interesting thing to watch. 
Um, and again, what, what does it do for us? It allows us opportunities. It creates opportunities and options for students, and that's something that we believe very strongly in. Um, you can see the types of places that we perform in, Carnegie Hall, Alice Tully Hall, as I mentioned, the Metropolitan Museum. The students perform all across the city, and that's, of course, the same for all three of our schools. So now I'm really thrilled to stop talking. <laughs> so you'll hear another voice. Um, but again, I do want to tell you how thrilled I am to see all of you, the smiling faces, the faces of the parents, the faces of the students. It's really, it's really something special. And um, speaking of something special, I'd like to introduce my colleague and my dear friend, Pippin Parker, the dean of the New School for Drama. A really extraordinary person, please. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I mean, so much of what Richard was um, uh, explaining to you and putting in context um, obviously relates to the work that we do. So um, just to, to give you a few a little bit of an overview. So the drama, School of Drama at the New School has about 250 students. About uh, 60 of those are in our MFA program uh, for actors, writers, and directors, and the rest in our BFA program, which are actors, writers, directors, and creative technologists. However, having said that, Many, many, if not most of our undergraduate students really identify themselves as hyphenates or as artists working across genres. So they consider them, themselves writer actors, actor directors, director creative technologists, and every single uh, variation thereof. Um, this is a school that really um, is uh, focused on three things, I think. Relevance of training, collaboration, and engagement, and um, we'll talk a little bit about what that uh, means. Um, these are students, <laughs> students in our uh, theater on Bank Street. Um, so there's two types of performances in, uh, which happen, there's actually many more than that, but, I'll, but as a quick uh, thumbnail sketch, we have main stage productions, four main stage productions a year, and then we have a whole host of other energy and activity going on that are performance oriented. I would like to highlight one specific program that we have which is called Creative Cafe, which really speaks to the engagement and to the entrepreneurial part of the work that we do. And this is a program that allows students to propose uh, productions. They could be plays, they could be uh, extant plays, they could be new plays, they could be films, they could be some kind of project that is not easily described in the kind of traditional genres. Uh, they propose these projects, um, they have to um, go through a process which mirrors the kind of process that you would have to do for um, fundraising uh, and application for grants. Uh, they're vetted, uh, vetted by, our, um, by our administrative office and some of our production people and then provided some space and uh, a tiny little bit of money, I can't remember how much it is, like $100 literally, um, to put these uh, performances on. These are students doing them on their own, some faculty and um, other student guidance, but essentially they are making their own work, which is something that we believe in deeply and we believe that this is one of the hallmarks of when we talk about relevance, what that means. It means being able to leave this place and go out into the world and have a, um, a network of like-minded artists and an understanding of what it's gonna take to uh, make your own work, to not have to wait for the phone to ring, to not rely on an agent or a manager or any of the other kind of um, what we would consider the, the traditional structures, industry structures, but to be able to be always pursuing that and always having agency over your own work. Something that's particularly critical for actors as we're looking at the new landscape of the entertainment industry. Oh, yeah, I'm, and that's over. Um, so, <laughs> but that's enough, that's a little teaser. A little later on, we're gonna have a chance to talk very specifically about drama. I'll have a chance, we'll have a chance to talk to, um, in particular, the parents and do a much longer Q&A. And um, the acting students, I believe, are gonna do a workshop um, with each other and be able to hang out and talk to some of our current students who will be very honest and forthright and um, kind of let you know what it's really like on the ground. And it's my uh, total pleasure to introduce my pal, uh, Keller Coker, who is the Dean of the um, uh, School of Jazz and Contemporary Music and also Associate Dean of the College of Performing Arts. All right. Thank you, Pippin. 
Thank you. Uh, once again, I want to uh, welcome you all. And thank you for being here and for making the decision to come to the new school. You, by doing this, have placed a great deal of trust in us. Uh, you've decided to, to basically begin your career in the greatest city to do that in the world at the greatest university that you could have chosen. There are, there are a few things that we do here. You've already heard both of my colleagues talk about collaboration. And I just want to piggyback on that a little bit. Because you can find most schools uh, across the country or across the world that have drama departments and classical music and jazz, all sorts of things. But what you have here at the new school are three incredibly successful independent schools that have chosen to come together and create a completely new kind of college. One where all of those disciplines not only get along, but get along fabulously. We want to do things together because we recognize, as I'm sure you already do, that most universities are way behind the curve. They're not thinking about this. They're not thinking about what happens when you finish school, which is you collaborate. That's the only thing you do when you finish school, as soon as you're out. And, and there's almost no place that prepares you to do that than the place that you've decided to come. So thank you for making that decision and placing that trust in us. What Pippin talked about with drama as well is, is true with the School of Jazz and Contemporary Music and, and what Richard talked about with Manus. Relevance is key. Most, most curricula across, across, univers, across universities is incredibly dated. Uh, you, have, um, you have faculty that have been teaching exactly the same class every single year for the last 30 years without considering what, what might be relevant to students today, to, to people who are ready to get started and to create the music and the culture, the artistic culture of the future. And it's more, it's more than just the artistic culture, right? Because you're, as cultural leaders, you're going to be shaping the entire world. You're going to be creating the works that people listen to, that move people's hearts, that change their minds. This is the path that you've chosen. And we couldn't be more excited to be with you as you, come, as, as you move along that path. At the School of Jazz and Contemporary Music, we focus greatly on, uh, on, on who it is that you are, what your voice is. That's why we have such a long name, School of Jazz and Contemporary Music, right? Because what does that encompass? That encompasses everything. Right? That opens the door for, for your artistic voice to develop and, and really create the, whatever the, the next musical languages are going to be, whatever the next thing that the performing arts is going to be. That's, that's what we want, we want you to do, and we absolutely believe that that's what you want to do, or you wouldn't be here. And so, I mean, with that, really, that is, that is what we're about. Um, you across the entire new school have a, have a great deal of choice here at, uh, in the College of Performing Arts. You have more choice than, than you can even imagine today. There's no other school that, uh, um, that you choose your private teacher, right, from a list that includes anyone who lives in New York City, <laughs> right? I will put them on the faculty tomorrow if you want to study with them. I mean, this is, this is how you will be able to develop who you are. There's no other school where you decide what kind of music you want to work on for the next 15 weeks, decide who you want to be in the band with you, and who you want to teach the group. I promise you, there is no other place where that can happen. And it happens here every single semester. We run 80 ensembles every semester, and you never play with the same people two semesters in a row, and never have the same teacher. So you get to explore the entire culture. That's enough. That's enough for <laughs> me. Right? OK. So I did, oh, thank you. Yeah. So I did want to ask the deans to maybe highlight, and some of them have already, any, <laughs> any courses that you would like to shout out about the very responsive and very unique curriculum 
at the College of Performing Arts. Anything you have left to say about that? Um, well, well, certainly we talked about, um, it's been referenced a couple of times, the um, Improvisational Artist Lab, which is um, actors, uh, actors, directors, and writers, students from jazz, students from Manus, who are really, um, and this isn't learning about how each of the different disciplines improvise, because each discipline, right, has its own theory or multiple <laughs> theories of improvisation. This is actually students in a room coming up with their own version, starting with a blank slate and saying, how do we develop a language, an improvisatory language together? What does that mean? And what do we want to discuss? And one thing we maybe haven't touched on that much is, you know, we talk about training and making and meaning. Meaning is very, very important. Our students are always uh, obviously, they're very intelligent, they're very engaged, they're aware of the uh, uh, situations and the, the sort of social nature of their work, and they're also helping us um, define to what are we going to apply this artistry, what are the, what are the um, issues that are um, informing our work, and what do we want our work to inform. So that's one of those places where that, uh, that happens. Thank you. I'll take another one. So it's a new, it's a relatively new course. So um, it's a Manus course, but these courses, I, do, I think they do illuminate other courses in the other schools as well. So we know that, um, you know, if you want to be an, if you want to be a musician, you have to be, you have to have the skills to work in communities. You have to have pretty good curatorial chops. It's no longer the issue of you just create any program and play it anywhere. You really want to think, what program do I want to play? Where am I playing and who am I playing for? You might be playing for um, senior citizens. You might be playing for kindergarten kids. You might be playing in a hospital. You might be playing at an airport. You might be playing at Carnegie Hall. Each one of these kinds of programs requires a different skill in thinking about who the audiences are and what you want to bring to them. So what we did was we took a, a relatively young string quartet, which had a year or two before won Concert Artist Guild's um, competition for string quartets, the public quartet. And we felt that they were one of the strongest groups that we'd seen in terms of working with the community. I should also mention that Manus has the Orion String Quartet in residence. They're not as good with the community. They're, they're one of the great string quartets of the world. They don't probably don't play for kindergarten kids. Um, <laughs> but the public quartet plays for everyone. And they are so smart and they are so innovative. So we brought in a couple of members of the public quartet to work with um, ensemble students at Manus. The ensemble students are coached in chamber music classes. So it's not, a, it's not coaching them in chamber music, but it's working with the students to develop ideas on what kinds of programs they want to develop who they would develop it for, what kinds of participation they might use, what, what do they, how do they want to speak to audiences. So they have this super innovative young string quartet that's doing some of the most interesting work that you could ever imagine. And they are working with the young musicians at Manus, trying to help them figure out how they bring this sort of sensibility, not only in terms of being the best ensemble players they can be, <coughs> but how they're going to bring that playing to, the, to um, audiences and what's going to make it really special, and particularly what will make it special related to who they are and what they want to do as artists. So as you can see, I'm only slightly excited about this course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very sure. much. Sure. Yeah. I've, I've got one, too, if, okay. if I could. So we're, um, we're rethinking the way that music history is taught. Um, and in fact, not even thinking in terms of music history, but thinking of musicology, right? this, the academic study of music. And so we've got new courses. Uh, that, that don't look anything like what music history courses look like at most other schools. We've got one course starting in the fall that's called Smalls Live. Smalls is one of, uh, uh, one of the greatest jazz clubs in, in, uh, in the world, in New York City. And uh, the person who owns Smalls is a School of Jazz and Contemporary Music grad. And so he's been taping for the last 13 years every performance that happens in that club. And so now he is going to come and teach a class about the contemporary jazz scene in New York City and give all the students in that class access to those 13 years of performances. And they can, and they can look at, at music uh, or music history from a contemporary point of view. We're also going to run a class in, in songwriting and the songwriting revolution in Greenwich Village, taught by a songwriter who was, who was active right at the end of that period. 
And thirdly, we just brought a filmmaker in last year who did a film called Take Me to the River, two films, one on, on Memphis and uh, one that's coming out on New Orleans. And we're developing a class called Take Me to the River, which is about the history of American soul music f um, along the Mississippi River from Detroit to New Orleans. That's what music history looks like here, right? Again, relevance and contemporary work. Thank you, yes. So, are you guys excited? One other thing to highlight about the curriculum here is that our jazz students have the opportunity to complete both a BA through Lang and a BFA through the jazz school. And all three schools have the opportunity to complete a bachelor's master's pathway with our master's of arts in arts management and entrepreneurship. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, you, did I say that? If that's something you're interested in, um, that's not a decision you have to make right away, but it is a huge opportunity. And clearly, this is the kind of school that takes those thoughts of entrepreneurship, the business side of the industry, and understanding who you are as an artist and creating your own, own work very seriously. And I'm going to just interrupt because, you yeah. know, we said we're kind of. Yeah. Up, I want to tell you a little bit about this program. I'll make it quick. Um, because what happens is when people hear arts management, um, they might be looking at it from a sort of um, more backwards lens. Traditionally, programs in arts management or programs um, in arts administration were essentially created for artists who were going to leave performing to go get administrative chops and then go run an organization. It was really the way over the last 20, 30 years all these programs worked and I lectured in, almost, in, in three or four of them in New York and one of them in Italy. Um, over my career. We wanted to create a different type of program and it speaks to who we are. So what we believe is that every artist needs skills in entrepreneurship um, and arts management. And we have minimal, we have baseline courses across all three schools that basically ensure that you will have some work that you do no matter which program you're in. What we wanted to do, however, is we wanted to create a program for those artists that knew that had already recognized that in order to follow their artistic path, in order to do the things they wanted to do artistically, that they would need strong skills in arts management and entrepreneurship. It's that trumpet player that wants to create a K-12 arts education organization, perform in the organization, and run the organization. It's that opera singer who wants to create the small opera company, and opera singers are doing these things, run that company and sing in that company. It's the um, jazz trumpet player who wants to create his or her own record label, record themselves on the record label, but also record others on the record label, and knows that he or she can play the trumpet and will play the trumpet well, but that part of what they want to do with their career and their life is they want to take charge of how they make recordings, and that this degree is designed specifically for that. It's different. So in a sense, I wanted to, I really wanted to be part of a movement that um, didn't say to artists, in order to have these skills, you should leave the performing arts behind. We wanted to have a degree that said, this is the kinds of things that artists need and that you can have these skills and you can also be an artist and we want to support you in that. So that's the difference with this program. Thank you. All right. And um, we have already highlighted your opportunity to pursue a minor while you're in school, but I do want to reiterate the opportunity to not have to choose between your passions. You can take minors within the College of Performing Arts, but you can also take minors across the university. So if you've always been passionate about fashion, if you've always been passionate about psychology, it's not something that you have to give up to be part of the new school and to be a part of the College of Performing Arts. Um, we also have incredible facilities here at the school. You will have the opportunity to tour the facilities. Um, we have beautiful performance spaces. Upstairs is Tishman that houses 800 students and that you will see amazing performances there. I was most recently at Unsilent Film Night, which this time was a jazz performance, but in the past has been a Manus performance. Um, but the students were improvising live to silent films. It was an incredible, it was an incredible night. I highly recommend that event. Um, we have beautiful spaces. We have amazing faculty. We have beautiful students. There's no reason to not want to be at the new school. We want you to engage in our campus life. <laughs> That's Gnarls the Narwhal. He is our mascot. Did you know that the new school had a mascot? Yes. 
now you know, accomplished pianist, Gnarls the Narwhal. Um, we want you to be part of the varsity athletics. You want to, we want you to be part of group fitness classes, outdoor adventure activities. It is not all just performances, but almost every night there are public prog programs and performance opportunities here at the school. Um, gentlemen, I didn't know if you had anything to highlight or to speak at. There's, there's Unsilent Film Night. In the middle there? Yeah, there's John Zorn with uh, Dean Kessler on top. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to highlight in terms of public programming that hasn't well, been Well, I mean, across the universe, I can't remember the number. There's something like 1,300 uh, public programs offered across the year. It's ridiculous. There's so much that um, it's, a, it's an embarrassment of riches. Um, and uh, many of these are... Um, uh, anything from presentations to panels to performances by uh, artists uh, both here in New York and internationally and student recitals, student performances. Uh, there's just an incredible wealth. Um, probably one of our biggest challenges is um, letting everyone know uh, how much there is on any given night. I assure you, you can go into uh, at least three different performance spaces in the, across the university and see something incredible. We have over 750 performances just in the College of Performing Arts alone. So it could be one night there will be an oboe recital, uh, oboe and piano, um, doing a graduation recital. It might be uh, the very next night the Orion String Quartet is traversing the Beethoven String Quartets, which they're actually going to be doing with us next year. Or it's the New School Concerts, which is another arm of what we do, which presents um, string quartets, chamber ensembles from all over the world. It could be the Stone, um, as I mentioned, five nights a week. It'll, it could be the Amani Wind Quintet, one of the great wind quintets of the world, another one of our resident ensembles performing concerts all year long. Um, so we have faculty performing recitals, we have special guests. What uh, Keller mentioned earlier, the Take Me to the River, that was a partnership with the Grammy Museum. So we're working with all kinds of institutions, both student and professional. And as I said, um, the, really the challenge has been how do you get the word out for 750 concerts. That's been the kind of challenge. Right, I would like to mention um, also one thing, just looking here, because I see um, this bottom picture here is from, uh, it's either from MT Lab, Music Theater Lab, or from the MT Lab Cabaret. And music theater is a, um, an area we're moving aggressively into. Uh, we anticipate a degree in a couple of years, uh, undergraduate degree, but our students are involved uh, quite a bit in music theater. This, what you see right here is, um, that's uh, Thomas Correa, who's a BFA, BFA student. This is an opera Manus uh, PDPL student, Mario. Uh, there's Aaron Jenkins from, um, from Manus, who's an opera singer. There's Zach, who is basically now a a music theater composer in the last year. He's found his people and converted, I think, from a <laughs> Mattis uh, composition student. Um, and so, and then students from jazz in the background there on uh, bass, on guitar, and, and that's, drums. And, and that's Natalie um, to the left, one from the left. Um, she's on tour with Beyonce right now. So um, this is just emblematic. This is a performance that they did. So it's another great, um, th th which did actually end up in a couple of public presentations. So just a Bring Thanks, it back David. to public programming. I love it. Yes. So Richard has already mentioned a number of our notable new schoolers, though they are incredibly vast. Um, but sometimes I find that so the graduates that happened a long time ago or that are, you know, sort of the B. Arthurs or the Bradley Coopers or the Eleanor Roosevelt's aren't necessarily that identifiable. So one thing that we've done is put together a group of more recent graduates who you may or may not have heard of, but who are doing really amazing things here. Well, here's Jordan Cooper, who is actually not an alum. Uh, he is a soon-to-be alum, because he's in his uh, final few weeks as a, a senior uh, in the um, uh, in the BFA program. He came in as an actor, I believe uh, auditioned in as an actor, uh, began writing plays, and Jordan uh, just had a workshop of his play done at the Public Theater. That play was actually di uh, directed by an alum of the MFA program. Uh, that play will be is in the season at the Public Theater next year. I th think he will be the youngest playwright ever produced at the Public Theater. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yes. Yeah. Nadine Sierra, um, she's, she may be the most significant, somewhat early career soprano um, in the world. She's pretty close to it, um, leading roles already uh, very early in her career at the Metropolitan, at the San Francisco Opera. She just run the, won the Richard Tucker Award last year. 
Um, she just gave um, in February at the Armory, which is um, a very cool uh, performance space in New York on the east side. She gave two nights of um, solo recital with piano, performing with another Mana Salam. And Nadine is um, taking the world by storm. I should also say that um, it's interesting to us as well that she has a very deep and abiding interest in fashion as well, and has not only been interested, um, has been interviewed about her performance career, but she's been interviewed about um, sort of her fashion sensibility. Um, so we think that's a particularly uh, interesting thing, but I would encourage any of you, if you ever get a chance to hear Nadine sing, she is just um, absolutely out of the world, and also is an incredibly sweet person too. Ah, James, James <laughs> Francis. Yeah, this is this is always inspiring. I mean, we've we've looked at this presentation before, and uh, we just keep going down the list. It's amazing. So James Francis just graduated um, uh, last last spring. Uh, incredible piano player uh, uh, was uh, was listed at, at one point. Uh, by a major jazz publication as one of the eight musicians that you have to know uh, playing jazz in the world. He was uh, nominated for and won a Grammy his senior year here, uh, working with Chance the Rapper. And, um, and you can regularly see him on the Jimmy Fallon show. Uh, by his junior year, he was playing uh, uh, with The Roots. And, uh, and playing on the Jimmy, Jimmy Fallon show uh, uh, at some point almost every week. Becca Brunstetter uh, graduated from the MFA program. Becca is an incredibly prolific uh, playwright. She came, she's from uh, North Carolina. She came to study writing plays. Her family, uh, she's from a military family in uh, North Carolina, and her family assumed that she was coming to New York to write musicals because they had really were not people who uh, attended plays. She came, um, uh, I had the great opportunity to teach her. Uh, she graduated, she, um, um, began work, working in television. She is a uh, staff writer, I'm sorry, she's one of the showrunners, I believe, executive producers of, um, of This Is Us for NBC. Mm -hmm. uh, she has a play that was just being produced at the, uh, I believe, the Globe in San Diego. Uh, has uh, was commissioned by the Roundabout Theater Company in New York uh, almost immediately upon graduating, and she has about uh, 45 other credits since graduating. <laughs> Yekwon Sun Woo just won the Van Cliburn Award last year, um, one of the top piano competitions in the world. He was, um, uh, he was a PDPL student, graduated I believe in 2015, um, and he's off to, as anyone who would win the Van Cliburn Award, he's off to just the most glorious career. Uh, terrific player, terrific guy too. So yeah, Robert Glasper, um, you know, uh, one of the most popular and sought after musicians in the world today. So graduated in 2010, I think, won his first Grammy in 2012. He's won three, he's been nominated for six, been nominated for, for an Emmy as well, did the soundtrack for the uh, Miles Davis uh, uh, film, Miles Ahead. And... Um, yeah, incredible piano player. Uh, also, yeah, nominated for a Grammy for his work with Kendrick Lamar on Pimp a Butterfly. That's, uh, yeah, Robert Glasper, one of ours. Amazing. So hopefully you're feeling inspired and not overwhelmed. Yes? <laughs> or maybe a little bit of both. Both? Good. We don't expect you to be there now. But what I want to show you is that not 30 years from now, not 100 years from now, but very soon, we hope to see great things from some of the people sitting in this room. So I do want to talk just very briefly about next steps and a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we want you to become a New Yorker. Is anyone already a New Yorker? <laughs> we want you to continue to be a New Yorker. So some of the things that I just want to touch on. I should wait. Let me just say this quote. There's a famous quote about New Yorkers that okay. New Yorkers are born every day without respect to geography. Excellent. That's a good one. I love it. So a big part of this day is to help you make the decision about whether or not you want to attend the new school. So the first thing that you need to do if you have decided this is the school for you is submit your deposit. It's very easy. There's a link in your letter. You go right to it. There is a $500 non-refundable deposit 
to save your spot here at the new school. If you're interested in the dorms, they are giving tours today. We recommend that you're for your first year, if you haven't lived in New York before, that you stay in the dorms. It is not required, it's not mandatory. The housing deadline is July, or, oops, June 15th. Thank you. Um, June 15th, and there is a $350 deposit to hold your space in the dorms. Um, registration will begin in June, and you will be contacted by your advisors, some of whom are in the room. You want to give a wave? Hi, advisors. They're going to be calling you starting beginning June 1st? June 4th. June 4th. That's what I said. <laughs> um, and then orientation will happen in August prior to classes beginning. Should you need anything during this transitional period, please reach out to our performing arts email account. If you, I see somebody with the phone out. If you feel like you'd like to take a picture of that to remind yourself, feel free. Um, but we want to make sure that your questions are being answered, and from there, we can get you to the right person. Sound like a plan? Thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing your students here for today. Thank you for all of the work you've put in up to now. We're so grateful to have them. We're so grateful that they're the kind of musicians and actors and performers that they are.